Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing marvellously well. In this episode, we've got our good friend, Adam Steele, who is going to be showing us how he records a rock bass. And this is like a pretty awesome course, like a recording bass with an amp, with a microphone, using pedals, DIs, you name it. So check it out. Thank you, Mr. Adam Steele. Take it away. Recording rock bass with Adam Steele. Hello everybody and welcome to this video on the ultimate bass tone, especially for rock and metal. Um, if this, if rock and metal aren't really your thing, stick around anyway, because there's loads you might learn from this ridiculous setup that I'm doing today. Because this is what happens when I push the boat out with bass recording and really go all in on making sure I cover every angle and have the fatness, the warmth, bit of compression, bit of directness, bit of grit, and also the ridiculous distortion you could just hear then, uh, which are all separate things I can then blend in a mix later on. But I can also track with it, and it's almost entirely analog apart from a few little tricks. So let's walk you through what I've done and how I've done it to make the new version of my theme song. So first things first, I'm going from a bass, the bass is the most important thing, the sound of the bass is the most important thing. And I'm umming and ahhing between this bass which I had built recently, which has these Nordstrand pickups, and a Schecter which has EMGs. I'll come back to this choice of bass in a second, we'll talk about the clean DI tone first so we've got something to work with. So I'm going straight from the bass into the Kali 76 compressor. That compressor is very, very fast, which means it can keep any wild dynamics in check. I'm not using it super heavily, but I'm using it enough that big notes get kind of pulled in a little bit. Um, it's the base edition, which means that it's got things like a high pass filter on the compression, so it doesn't just pump with lower notes. It's got a dry blend, so there's quite a lot of the original signal in there as well. And I keep it a relatively low ratio, a relatively slow attack and very fast release, because I, again, I don't want pumping. It doesn't do much, but what it does do is keep things in line. And then I'm going into this Rodenberg 707 Clean Boost, which is a bit of a tone shaper as well. It gives me a little bit more of a kind of a deep low end and brings the mids out a little bit. And that's going into the mother of all DI boxes, the Avalon U5. This thing is bananas. This is so over the top ridiculous for a DI box, it's insane. It's actually on loan from my friend Chris. Hi Chris. And I don't think I'm going to give it back. I'm probably going to have to give him the money for it because this thing is insane. And it's got uh, a choice of kind of tone networks, which is kind of like a passive uh, mid scoop, which I like. It's not doing very much, but it's doing something. And so the tone of this bass, mostly with this bridge humbucker pickup, but a little bit from the neck too, sounds like this. <laughs> There is a tiny little background noise going on, that's because I've got all the lights and all the cameras and all the computer and everything around me causing a little bit of uh, electromagnetic interference, which isn't ideal, but is fine, and that's going to be something that we'll work on very shortly. I think I'm going to experiment with the other bass. So this bass just came in from Schecter, and I think for this song the tone is... Uh, far preferable. The other one's got a bit more of that kind of Tony Levin sledgehammer kind of thing going on. This one's got more of the mid scoop and the more aggressiveness, which I'm looking for for this particular kind of rock thing. For the And that's got that that tone that just works for me. And so that this is active electronics with EMGs, but all the EQ and everything is completely at flat. I'm using both of the pickups, and they are going through the Cali to the Rodenberg to the Avalon. Now, this is where it gets 
crazy because that's just the DI sound and I'm not usually a fan of DI sounds although I've recently started blending them back in with everything else that's going on. So let's go to step number two. Step number two is what I kind of call the ultimate clean bass tone. So after the Avalon it's going out to a splitter from Saturnworks and it's being fed over to my amp rack and in the amp rack there's, there's a tuner which helps but the main thing is that's now rooted routed if you're American out to an Ampeg SVT now this is a solid state SVT but it's so close to the valve SVT for what I'm doing in a studio that I'm quite happy with it as it is that's going out into the live room into an Ampeg 4x10 cabinet and is mic'd up with a brand new Roswell audio Mini K47, which is very much like the U47 FET from Neumann. It's that kind of thing, although it's a, you know it's it's smaller, compact. It's got no controls on it, and between them, I have the EQ dialed back a little bit, which is surprising that with this, it now sounds like so. So there is uh, an ultra low switch on the amp which is currently off and there is an ultra high switch which is also off, I don't need them. This uh, head and speaker combo seem to be quite bright, I'm not even micing the middle of the speaker, it's slightly off to kind of tame a little bit of that presence but it gives me that classic ultra lean bright <laughs> That kind of thing. And so that sounds really good to me because it's got that control, it's got warmth. It's got a little more brightness than I thought I wanted, but in a mix, you'll find that brightness is your friend. Unless you're doing something like Motown, in which case you are gonna be kind of And that extra top end, I suppose, isn't really necessary. Uh, but a lot of it's to do play style. I'm quite aggressive with my hands. The strings are relatively new on this, they've they've dulled a little but they're not at the point where I need to change them I don't think, uh, but they're, if I was to do another session these would have to be replaced because they're, I don't want to be replacing high end at the amp stage if you know what I mean. And then thirdly, because this is, this is where it gets a bit mad, is thirdly the splitter from Saturnworks is also going off to the Tech 21 landmark. Now that thing's got a lot of grit and a lot of guts and it's also got a lot of sub information in there. It's actually, if you think about it, it's two Sansamp pedals strapped together. It's the two different models. One of them's providing the cleaner and more subby thing and the other's providing all the grit. And again, that sounds like a lot and it might sound like overkill, but just you wait. <laughs> So at this point, I'm going to combine all these three in the DAW and I had to check for phase and the Ampeg was out of phase with the Avalon and with the Sans Amp. So I checked those, made sure the volumes all come through. There we go. I, I, I forgot to mention on the Ampeg, once it's been mic'd up, that's actually going to a custom preamp from my friend Bart Herc, which is very Neve kind of style. It's got British console flavor. Then it's going into a tape emulation hardware thing, which is a lot like the Neve Portico one, but it's actually from Herc, the 552. And that's then going into the Drama 1960 which is the optical compressor, which is really keeping that particular source kind of level, but with the compressor th at that point, already having compressed before the signal, that compressor is an optical slow release compressor with a dual release that's just keeping that kind of sat like an LA-2A kind of thing would. 
And so that with the DI and with the Sans amp gives us that big. Now this is where it gets clever because this is going to be a big rock mix and this is where more drive and distortion comes into play. And so what I'm going to be doing here is I'm running the Avalon, the clean DI, into a copy of Amplitube because using the cleanest signal to feed that really helps and that is driving two different amps, one on each side, which I know is slightly unconventional, but again, we're going all out here and the unconventionality really helps this. And I think when we get to the ultimate guitars, this will really help it sit in the mix and stand out around the wall of guitar that we're gonna be doing. Sorry everyone, just thought I'd interrupt myself for a second there. Sorry, me and uh, tell you a little bit about how I did the drive thing in Reaper. By the way, I did the ultimate Reaper guide. If you didn't already know that um, I taught you through all the basics and the routing, all that kind of stuff, really bit by bit in the ultimate Reaper guide, which is a Pro Mix Academy course. The link is available in the description. Check that out. So what we've got here is a folder full of bass tracks. So this is the bass group. And you can see that all our tracks here are indented. So what I could do is drag my tracks. You just grab the track, shift and click up, and then you see this little blue line become an indent. And then there you go. Suddenly this has become a folder and all the sound now comes out of the bass group. I didn't have to do anything special. That was it. That was the whole thing. And now I get all of these channels. <laughs> And so the Ampeg and the Sans Amp are exactly as was. The Ampeg, as you can see here, has its polarity flipped because it's out of polarity with everything else. And the drive, the drive is, and I'll go through this a little more, Amplitude with a governor, sorry, they call it the ambassador pedal, a noise gate, because it's going to be noisy. And two amps which are hard panned but the way that I get the sound to there you'll see there are only three lots of sound those are all the different takes you see the pink and you see the green I chose little bits of different takes there uh, using the take lanes which you just hit the letter T to change takes super easy they're all there and you can crop them down you can make them look a lot less messy than that if I go take crop to active take that looks more like it there we go and so the drive channel here, if I solo that, doesn't have any audio on it. What's going on there? So the way I've done that is the DI track up here has a send. And all I had to do was, if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is a lot like Pro Tools' uh, mix window, where you can send from one source to another. And all I had to do in Reaper was drag from one of these empty send slots onto drive, drag and drop, done. Now that's doubled it up. So let's open the drive. And the one thing that I wanted to change is in the routing, by default, it's post fader, post pan, post effects. So any processing that I would have done to the DI would then have gone on to affect the drive channel. But by changing that to pre effects, that's also pre fader, that now sends a completely clean uh, sound from the DI, no matter what effects I choose in post to put on that DI, that will not then go on to subsequently affect the drive channel. I do this quite a lot in Reaper where I can have parallel processing, but only need to edit one single waveform. That way I can keep it consistent. There's no chance of any accidental smearing. I'm not having to double up on edits, triple up on edits. I use it a lot on things like snares if I want to do a parallel compression or something like that. I but keep the editing clean. So this is how I've done that. Reaper is awesome. And then I just have my own volume slide of a drive there separate from the DI. And so it's then treated there's three separate waveforms here because they are completely different analog inputs with different audio. And the one with no audio at the bottom is digital only, but fed from this one up here. So there you go. If you want to know more about that kind of stuff, check out the Ultimate Reaper Guide. Now, 
back to me and the bass. So that's an orange on one side and a Marshall on the other. And each one has its own distinct flavour and they kind of sit in different EQ pockets. Uh, there's a very heavy noise gate before all of that and there's also a Marshall Governor pedal in there driving both amps just to get a certain mid push that I was really looking for. I didn't want fizz from the amps, I definitely wanted that mid growl thing because the high end's already taken by both the main guitars and it's going to be taken by that high end on the bass that's in the Ampeg and in the Sans amp right down the middle so I don't want to be doubling up on frequency ranges and the other sources that I have are relatively mid scooped so I'm filling the mids back in with these other sources. <laughs> And after that, in the Amplitube software, there is an EQ that removes a lot of the low end because I don't need more low end on top of what I already have. And then there is an LA-2A version of the, uh, in the plugin which keeps the uh, drive under control. And then that blends in. What you're hearing now is the Avalon plus the drive. <laughs> The Ampeg amp has a noise gate in its effects loop just to stop any background noise and the Sans amp has a gate plugin to do the same thing. Those are the only other plugins I've got. Apart from the Amplitube doing the amp grind, this is all analog and it sounds like this. Sounds massive, so now I've got to record that in with the drums. There we go, took a few takes, but I think we got it. Did you notice then when the drums were playing that the whole bass, all that extra distortion, extra drive, kind of just fell into the background? People think when you're dialing in modern rock and metal bass tones that, oh, there's way too much distortion. No, <laughs> once the guitars and the drums are in there, that will be drowned. So you, once you're careful about your EQ placements, I mean, it might be that I turn some of this up or down, do a slight EQ tweak. This is all with zero EQ, by the way. This is all just each thing, like the amp over there is dialed in, this amp's dialed in, uh, the drive is dialed in for its own sound, but the overall bass has not been EQ'd to fit in the mix. It just kind of does. And they say the best EQ is no EQ, and of course there is a little going on here, but getting the right tones at the start does help with the battle. So, I hope you enjoyed this little journey here, the ultimate bass tone. Next time is the ultimate guitar tone, and that one we're going all out. Multi, multi mic, then into splitters, mixers, all sorts of clever stuff to get some of the biggest sounds on the planet. Thanks for watching everybody, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Please don't forget to subscribe. You can check out Adam's channel as well and have a marvellous time recording and mixing. <laughs>